Myers. Here to welcome you, I'm Harmer Brereton, and it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, I have known Ray for three years, but when I asked him to send over his resume, he sent me a summary of the 56-page resume that he has. And I thought, my goodness, you have to be 130 years old to have done all of that. <laughs> but obviously he's not. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Ray and his talk on global health. He has an extraordinary background, and I'll just sketch out some of the things that I thought were so interesting. He's taught in medical schools in Pakistan, South Africa, China, Nepal, Haiti, and Oman, as well as many schools in this country. He's a Fulbright Scholar. He's authored more than 300 articles. And of great interest to me, he had 14 times he has been nominated or elected the best teacher in the facility where he is. So we are going to have a very well-educated, extraordinarily good teacher talking to us today. Please join me in welcoming Ray Smigo. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, when, whenever anybody asks me to talk, especially on the subject of global health, I, I jump at the opportunity. And so this is a topic, obviously, that's been very near and dear to my heart in the last uh, 32 years. Actually, uh, I've worked and lived overseas for a little over 12 of the last 34 years. And, and uh, for many of the uh, years in between when I wasn't based overseas, I was directing an international health program and going with students anywhere from one to three months at a time. So um, I, I've always considered myself a global citizen, uh, as perhaps many of you as well. And uh, the world seems to be getting smaller every year. It doesn't seem that way. Well, we're going to talk about uh, this topic of global health disparities. And, and perhaps as we go through this, it may seem in part like a good news, bad news joke. Because there is obviously uh, some real inequities and disparities in the health of various populations around the world. Um, and lots of uh, discrepancies between the health of the world's richest nations and most developed nations and the world's uh, least developed nations. On the other hand, as we'll see, there is a lot uh, of achievement in the last 100 years. And we're going to focus uh, in the next 45 minutes on, on the last 100 years or so. Now, I have some slides. I have a number of slides, some that have text. Uh, but also some that, that show various segments of, uh, of populations in, in Asia and in Africa. And I think that'll keep the talk a little bit light. Now, I haven't referenced any of the text slide that I've made, but I've drawn all of this talk from the first chapter in our textbook called Understanding Global Health. It was published in December of 2007, and the second edition is in preparation right now, should be ready uh, early 2000, uh, late 2012. So look for it. Well, these are our learning objectives today. First of all, I want us to look back retrospectively and understand the, the major problems and achievements that have occurred in public health global public health in the last 100 or 200 years. Then I want to briefly dis describe the, the current trends in public health around the world. And finally, uh, finish with uh, mentioning some of the future challenges and threats to public health that we see in various parts of the globe. Well, let's start with an acknowledgement that the right to good health is really one of the basic human rights and, and, and uh, comparable in many respects to economic rights, to social rights, to civil and political rights. And this was first um, enunciated in the UN Declaration of Human Rights back in 1948. Uh, unfortunately, there seems to be some debate about this right to health care uh, in certain segments of our population, uh, unfortunately, but I think most of us here would agree that it is a, a fundamental uh, human right. 
As we talk about disparities in global health today, we're going to mention a whole host of impacting factors and overlapping factors, and I've shown them here. Poverty, education, unsafe water and sanitation, malnutrition, housing, disease burden, and including HIV AIDS. We're not going to touch on all of these, but we're going to mention some of these. And, and perhaps let's start with disease burden. Now my clinical background is, is in infectious diseases and tropical diseases, so this is a logical place for me to start. And let's go back a little over 100 years and look at the, the leading causes of death in the United States at around the, the turn of the 20th century. And you can see in this bar graph here that the three main killers in, in 1900 were pneumonia, including influenza, tuberculosis, and diarrheal diseases. Okay? Um, and infectious diseases, as we'll see, really predominated on the world stage as the major cause of disease burden for a hundred years, for more than a hundred years. Uh, back in 1900, the life expectancy for the typical American male was only 45.2 years. Uh, and a very short amount of time uh, before most people succumb to infectious diseases. Well, let's, let's think of our first bit of good news. In the last hundred years, we've made incredible, remarkable strides in life expectancy as shown by this slide. So that today, uh, the average American person lives 78 years. The same is true in Costa Rica, uh, a little bit longer still, 82 years in Japan. Uh, so we've gained 30 plus years in life expectancy in a little over 100 years. Now we haven't done as well in some of the uh, developing nations shown here, Pakistan, Haiti, Swaziland, um, but still, 22 to 25 years in many uh, lesser developed countries around the world. I have to mention Swaziland, look at that life expectancy, 32 years, the typical Swazi uh, native will live 32 years, and the, the hugest impact uh, of, of that markedly reduced life expectancy is gonna be HIV, AIDS, and we'll, we'll talk about more than, uh, in a little while. But there are, there are 15 countries where the life expectancy in 2011 is less than 50 years. That's still incredible, isn't it? Less than 50 years, and again, that's, that's almost exclusively due to HIV AIDS. Now this graph shows the linear relationship, and I, I, I imagine many of you or most of you can't really see this, so I'll kind of walk you through it. But in this graph, we see uh, along the, the linear axis, uh, or the linear line that's plotted, uh, life expectancy according to geographic regions of the world. And as you move from lesser developed nations at the bottom of the line to most industrialized nations at the top, you can see that there is this linear relationship. And all along the way, women live longer than men, all around the world, okay? They often have more disease morbidity, okay? But they usually live longer, and that's a very, consistent and interesting phenomenon. Well, we, I've already alluded to this huge impact on global health and global life expectancy in the last 25 years, and that's uh, HIV and AIDS. And I've selected one country as an example, and that's the country of Uganda, which for many years in the, in the 80s and 90s was the epicenter for HIV in the world. Um, in Central Africa. And you can see at the beginning of the HIV era, the life expectancy in Uganda was 47 years. Then it dipped down to about 39 years in 1995 to 2000. But now we're starting to see the life expectancy rebound. And as we'll see, this is due largely to the availability of anti-HIV medications, what we call heart therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy. We'll come back to that. So another piece of good news. In terms of disease burdens, as I had mentioned, for more than a century, infectious diseases remain the number one burden of, of illnesses uh, affecting humankind. And then last year, heart disease became the number one 
disease affecting populations around the world. Um, and there are other transition diseases. And we, when we say transition diseases, we mean diseases that are occurring in a population as that country goes from developing status to uh, improving status to developed status. And so we see cardiovascular heart disease, stroke, cancer. These are some very important transition diseases all around the world in just about every country. Um, we all already know that there is a global epidemic of obesity and with that comes increasing numbers of uh, patients with diabetes mellitus. Uh, then there are what we call lifestyle diseases. These are diseases that usually affect more developed countries, things like smoking and alcohol and IV intravenous drug abuse, but, but we see all these things occurring uh, uh, throughout many countries. And then mental illness. Well, we saw that bar graph that showed the life expectancy uh, in 1900 for a U.S. male. Here it is almost 100 years later in 1997. And you can see that uh, the infectious diseases have really been replaced by heart disease number one, cancer number two, and stroke number three. Now pneumonia and uh, pneumonia is here, but it's farther down the list and tuberculosis is not even, not even present, as we'll talk about. Um, I think among many people living in, in our country, uh, there is a, uh, a mistaken belief that tuberculosis has come under control. And in fact, TB is at an all-time low in the United States. We've never had fewer cases of tuberculosis in the U.S. than we have right now, about 13 or 14,000 cases per year. But TB is at an all-time high around the world. There have never been more cases of tuberculosis than there are right now. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So heart disease and stroke have become the leading causes of, of global death. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at uh, where these deaths occur, more than 80% occur in developing nations. Now, as a clinician, even I'm used to thinking of middle age white males who smoke uh, and who eat too much and don't exercise are those who get heart attacks. But in fact, uh, most heart attacks and other forms of heart disease actually occur in developing countries because the risk factors for heart attacks uh, and for strokes, such as smoking and diabetes and high blood pressure, are extremely prevalent overseas and they're even less well controlled overseas in a poor population for a variety of reasons. And the, uh, the saddest thing about cardiovascular diseases is that these are largely preventable diseases um, with some important lifestyle modifications, stopping smoking, controlling high blood pressure with often simple medication, controlling diet. Another bar graph that shows that um, in developing parts of the world, if you look at subsets of the global population, in developing countries, poorest countries, uh, infectious diseases are still number one causes of death and morbidity. Um, in developed countries like the U.S., like Europe, uh, it's these cardiovascular diseases, and uh, so there's there's still the dichotomy of disease burden around the planet. Staying with infectious diseases, what kinds of infections are, are, are important globally? Uh, acute pneumonias, or what we call lower respiratory tract infections, claim more than four million lives per year. Diarrheal diseases, a little over two million uh, lives per year. Same thing with HIV AIDS, two million. Tuberculosis, one and a half, and malaria. So still major infectious disease problems around the world. This is a hospital in Bangladesh, and this is a hospital about 600 beds that's devoted exclusively to diarrheal disease, okay? It's not like regional hospital or CMC where all kinds of diseases are admitted. Only patients that have uh, diarrheal disease are admitted to this large hospital, and you can see that it's overrun with patients. There's no dearth of patients. Uh, just from this simple uh, one kind of illness. 
Well, infectious diseases began to come under control in the early part of the 20th century with the improvements in sanitation and hygiene that started to develop. As, as the United States and other countries started to improve their, their sanitation and hygiene, um, that antedated uh, improvements that were the result of discovery of antibiotics and finding what diseases were causing uh, what illness and being able to target those with infectious diseases uh, with antibiotics. So simple lifestyle improvements uh, can be the first measure in controlling certain illnesses such as infectious diseases. But still in 2011 as we saw there's still major uh, problems around the world with infection and uh, this is a real challenge for, for uh, public health uh, officials. Now this is a list of some of the new infectious diseases that have developed in the last 25 years or so and you're going to recognize some of these. Uh, HIV AIDS, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, bird flu or avian influenza, um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a causative agent of Lyme disease. Everybody knows Lyme disease. SARS, Helicobacter pylori, which is the causative agent of peptic ulcers. Who thought peptic ulcer was an infectious disease, but lo and behold, it is. So these are the new diseases of the last uh, 25 years or so. And if that's not enough, these are the new ones that have developed in just the last few years. Uh, just as one example, we've gone from multi-drug resistant tuberculosis that's resistant to two major anti-TB drugs to extensively drug resistant TB which is re resistant to four and five and six and seven different anti-TB drugs. So the, uh, the, the microorganisms, the bugs, the critters as we say, they they're always seem to be one step ahead of us. Well, we've talked about HIV and the huge global impact that's had in the last 25 years. Uh, in this slide, you can see the largest concentration of HIV in young adults. And uh, I don't know if this projects well, but the color coding is such that, that Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is where the largest concentration or, or, or prevalence of HIV is in the world. Um, but because the largest absolute numbers of patients live in southern Asia, in other parts of Asia, India, China, that's where the greatest numbers of HIVs are. This map shows the HIV-related deaths that have already occurred. Now, we've already lost 30 million global citizens to HIV and AIDS. And there are another 40 million that are still infected right now that are HIV infected. So still a huge, probably the number one public health problem that exists today in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, five million new cases every year, two million HIV-related deaths. And look at this interesting social uh, statistic. Um, 18 million AIDS orphans around the world. Now, an AIDS orphan is defined as a person who's lost one and perhaps two, patient, uh, two parents from AIDS. Now, that child may not uh, himself or herself be HIV positive, but they're defined um, in, for public health reasons as uh, HIV orphans. And think of the uh, economic and social and political impact that that one statistic has on a country. Well, the good news is, is that highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart therapy, um, anti-HIV therapy is becoming increasingly available to the populations around the world that need it. Um, in the Bush administration, it seemed as if um, designating hundreds of millions of dollars to HIV control efforts around the world would be a, a, a real success. Uh, but dishearteningly, uh, those U.S. dollars about 10 years ago came with the stipulation that, that overseas governments had to purchase anti-AIDS medicine from the United States. And so a one-year course of these medicines that, that would have cost about four or five hundred dollars if they were produced in country, 
instead cost about sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars per patient and uh, so that was a little bit more than a little bit frustrating and in fact many countries chose to forego u.s funding and uh, and and and, and uh, go out on their own and make these these life-saving drugs uh, generically on their own and you can see the result here uh, from 2003 to 2008 uh, a dramatic increase in the number of people overseas that are receiving these life-saving medicines. It's still only at about 60 to 70 percent, so there are still a lot of poor HIV-infected patients in Asia and Africa and Latin America that need the drug that still can't afford it, and their governments can't afford it. Well, about 10 years ago, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, our, our number one public health watchdog in the United States, uh, published an article and they called it the 10 greatest 20th century public health achievements. And they looked back at public health in the last 200 years or so. And we can read through these. This is the list of 10. Control of infectious diseases, maternal child interventions, uh, providing safe wastewater systems, safer and healthier food, family planning, motor vehicle safety. This was a list of 10. But overwhelmingly, they concluded that the number one public health achievement in history was immunizations, was immunizations. This is a partial list of the vaccines that are available in 2011 that can prevent a whole host of infectious diseases. And collectively, these cause tens or hundreds of millions of lives every year. Um, and we all recognize these, these, these vaccines. Uh, measles, mumps, rubella, tuberculosis vaccine. The first vaccine back in 1798, uh, smallpox vaccine. Who would ever think that the first effective vaccine went back into the 1700s? But it did. And then within another 50 years, rabies, typhoid, cholera. So this is kind of like the, the, the uh, Guinness Book of World Records for, uh, for effective vaccines. These have been hugely uh, uh, effective in, in saving lives in, in the last few hundred years. And just to demonstrate how effective uh, uh, immunizations have been. In 1974, the World Health Organization developed its EPI program. EPI stands for Expanded Program on Immunizations. And it was designed to provide many of these vaccines to the world's population that needed them. And at the time, in 1974, less than 5% of the world's children were immunized against the initial six diseases that fell under the EPI program, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, measles, and tuberculosis. Less than 5% of the world's children were immunized against these diseases. 16 years later, in 1990, more than 80% of the world's children had been immunized. What a huge logistical success that was. And, and each year, because of the EPI program that has now expanded to, be, to, to include two new diseases, yellow fever and, um, and um, uh, hepatitis B, more than three million childhood deaths are prevented and lots of disease morbidity presented as well. And when these vaccines are introduced into population, they're incredibly effective. We'll see more than a 95% reduction and the invasive disease that's caused by, that, by that, that, that microorganism. So it used to be in the United States not too many years ago before the Haemophilus influenza vaccine in our country. Um, 25 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, the number one infection that American pediatricians saw was caused by a bacteria called Haemophilus influenza. It caused meningitis, it caused bone infections, it caused bloodstream infections, it caused uh, head and neck infections like epiglottitis. Every pediatrician saw this da daily in his or her practice or hospital. Now we, we're training pediatricians who have never seen a case of Haemophilus influenza of any kind. So these are incredibly effective and it proves collectively that it was the proper mindset um, and established 
pro policies and procedures that start from the very top of, of the political decision making that even poor countries can develop very, very effective vaccination programs. Well, I want to talk about a few other uh, global public health problems that exist today, infant and maternal mortality, world hunger and poverty, uh, displaced and refugee populations, and just a little bit about motor vehicle safety, workplace safety, and landmines. Um, more good news. You can see here the decremental decrease in infant mortality rates uh, from 1990 to 2003. This is during a 13-year period. Now remember, an infant mortality rate refers to the number of, of children dying before their fifth birthday, okay? And you can see in, in geographic regions, these are all, each bar represents different geographic regions of the world. You can see there's been a steady decrease in the, in the, in the uh, infant mortality rates all around the world. The solid dark bar or a dark line in the middle of every bar represents the uh, World Health Organization 200, 2015 uh, goal for infant mortality. You can see that most parts of the, of the world have not reached that goal, but they're getting closer. So that's the good news. The bad news is the last bar all the way over to the right represents the, the mean global infant mortality rate and it is 105 children per thousand, which means that still 10% of the world's children don't live until their fifth birthday. So as, as far as we've come, still lots of work to do. Well, this is a partial list of some of the interventions that have contributed to that decline of infant mortality in the 20th century. And again, I won't read through all these, but the, the, the three most major are Simple improvements in the standard of living. Again, better housing, safer water, better sewage. Just those simple things are more important than antibiotics. Uh, the reduction in vaccine preventable diseases, again, indicating the, uh, uh, the incredible importance of immunization policies. And then there's a number of very simple maternal child interventions. Uh, that people in the field, in this field, refer to as, oops, refer to as the GOBI 3F interventions. And GOBI 3F stands for growth monitoring, oral rehydration therapy, breastfeeding, immunizations again, and then the three Fs of food supplementation, family planning, and female education. Let's just briefly run through these. So the first letter stands for growth monitoring. Uh, this is a nurse uh, measuring the weight of a child, weighing the child with a very simple scale that she's hung uh, on a nail over a doorway in Pakistan. And the simple process of, of regularly measuring a child's weight, height, uh, is incredibly important in making sure that children get seen regularly and don't fall through the cracks. It seems like a very simple thing, but if you can go into a poor country and give a mother uh, what is often called a road to health card, a graph that she carries with her, uh, and every time she comes for a scheduled checkup, uh, her child is, is, is weighed and measured. And the, the health uh, providers in that country, in that town can follow the child's progress. And when that child falters in any way, when doesn't gain weight, doesn't uh, grow in length, then they can target that child for, for additional uh, interventions. Again, very, very simple. And you can take this simple scale and you can hang it over a doorway, or if you're in a rural area, you can hang it over the branch of a tree and it works just as well. So this is growth monitoring. This is a slide of a child who comes in with severe dehydration from diarrheal illness. And you can see the, the shape that this child's in. This is another picture. And so the O in GOBI 3F stands for oral rehydration therapy, teaching mothers all around the world how to very simply mix 
pre-prepared, pre-packaged uh, solutions that contain salt and electrolytes and a little bit of sugar and teaching them how to mix those safely using the right amount of water so that the solution is not too concentrated and then very simplistically showing them how to safely administer that life-saving fluid. Not rocket science, is it? This involves just spoon by spoon rehydrating your child that has watery diarrhea. But when you teach women, mothers, how to do that, you save millions of lives every year. So this is O, oral rehydration therapy. This is a great slide, isn't it? Both of the children are happy, the mother's happy, I'm happy. Um, this, is, this is a poster, a, a UN poster on the importance of breastfeeding. Remember, breastfeeding confers, transmits uh, uh, useful maternal antibodies to the child to help fend off infection. But when you breastfeed, you, instead of a formula feed, you don't have to mix that formula, that Western formula, with contaminated water and just continue that cycle of diarrheal illness. So this is B for breastfeeding. This is I for immunizations. This is a, a nurse-directed uh, vaccine clinic in the Aga Khan University uh, Hospital where I worked for four years. Uh, and this is a similar uh, medical student directed uh, vaccine clinic. So immunizations, we've already seen the importance there. This is a child who had an immuni a preventable illness. This is a child with neonatal tetanus, something that used to be epidemic all around the world. But the mother was not immunized with simple tetanus toxoid and the baby wasn't immunized. And unfortunately, this baby died. When I first went to Pakistan in the mid 80s, Every government hospital around the country had entire wars uh, uh, of neonatal tetanus, 50, 60 bed wars. And this is all you saw, is children that were suffering and dying from this disease. And then the Aga Khan uh, health system, the largest private health system in the world, launched its neonatal tetanus education project. And when I went back there 14 years later, um, Neonatal tetanus had, had been virtually eradicated from the city of Karachi, where I had been for two years and returned for two more, but it had been eradicated from almost a, every region in Pakistan. So again, the importance of immunizations. These are the three Fs. Female education is the first F, and that's really probably central to all of these maternal child interventions, right? The mother is the focus, the nucleus of the household. And if you can impart any new skills to the mother, you can improve the health of everyone in that family. So this is a, a, a training session uh, on how to, uh, how to administer OR, uh, uh, oral rehydration therapy or how to uh, correctly fill out growth monitoring cards. But in any event, this is an education center, a, a setting. Uh, where mothers come in with their children and they're given uh, knowledge that, that they can use uh, uh, in their household. And you can do female education uh, in a clinic setting or you can have visiting nurses and community, uh, visiting community health workers go into the household and talk to the mothers. Absolutely simple but life-saving. And up north in Pakistan where because of cultural practices, women aren't uh, as directly involved in, in providing health care. Still, these are all male community health workers that will go into the households and do the same thing. Okay, I've included this slide to kind of change direction a little bit. And it, it allows me to transition into the topic of global hunger, world poverty. This is something that you see all over Southern Asia. You see the poorest citizens just uh, ravaging through uh, or scavenging through uh, garbage heaps, looking for little bits of uh, metal, plastic, anything they can recycle in order to make a few rupees. There are still more than a billion people every day in 2011 that live on less than a dollar, one US dollar a day. That's hard to believe, isn't it? More than a billion people. There are about six and a half billion people on the planet. About 
more than a billion live on less than a dollar a day. And almost that many people suffer from hunger on a regular basis. So um, world hunger is still very much with us. And it seems as if hunger is extending to parts of, of our, our population as well. This is a map that shows the, the heaviest concentration of mal malnourishment. And again, the yellow color would suggest that uh, in terms of prevalence of hunger, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the number one site. But again, because of the, the huge numbers of people living in Asia, the largest burden of malnourished people live in, in Southern Asia and India and China. Similarly, water. More than a billion people uh, don't have access to free water. We take this incredibly for granted, don't we, when we turn on the tap. But this is how uh, most people in developing countries get their water every day. There's no running water. And they have water de uh, delivered in this, you can imagine, unsterile environment. This is from one of the urban slum areas called the Kachivadis in, in, in Karachi, Pakistan. This is what water looks like for many people. In, in some of those same slum areas, you'll see these, um, these uh, irrigation uh, paths meander through the, 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 uh, the slum area. And this is where people get their drinking water, where they wash their clothes, where they wash their dishes, where they defecate. This is water from most of the world's population. So you can see now why even before antibiotics, providing safe water has such a tremendous impact on global health. I'm not gonna talk about a few other, talk much in detail about a few other public health problems, but for example, motor vehicle safety. Uh, over a million deaths every year from, from driving. Uh, in the developed world, it's usually alcohol-related. Re uh, overseas, it's usually related to not having or not wearing uh, a seatbelt or using an infant seat. Uh, more than two million people worldwide uh, lose their lives in, in occupational uh, uh, settings, in the workplace. And as we, if we hear from time to time, uh, the mind, mining uh, worldwide is, is, the, is the unsafest uh, workplace. There are also landmines, 15 to 20,000 new landmine related injuries every year. And these are some huge numbers. Refugees and internally displaced persons. Uh, more than 16 million, almost 17 million refugees and more than 27 million internally displaced persons. Persons that have had to live, leave their, their homes their houses, uh, their towns, and move elsewhere because of political strife, because of uh, natural disasters. So these are huge numbers, and 80% of these refugees and uh, displaced persons live in poor countries. Uh, we could talk in, uh, for an hour or longer on this topic. There is entire 1,000-page uh, textbooks just devoted, just devoted to refugee health, um, but we don't have time today. But this is a huge global population, and these numbers are growing every day. More refugees now than ever before. Um, the last thing I want to talk on uh, before we uh, finish and, and answer, uh, open this up to questions is a number of very, very important uh, environmental and social determinants to health that exist today and, and will be increasingly important uh, in the next decade, in the next century. Let's talk about population growth. From 1900 to 2000, the world's population went from about 1.7 billion to about six to six and a half billion. But population project projections uh, uh, indicate that the world's population in the next century may climb to its, its, as high as 20 billion people on the planet Earth. Now imagine the potential public health impact that can have. 20 billion people li living uh, where a little over 6 billion live today. And then the aging of those populations because uh, it's likely that populations will continue to grow older, and that's good news, but that's going to have uh, uh, ramifications on those populations. 
global climate change. Is there anybody other than the, gov the, the governor of Texas that doesn't believe in global climate change? Um, every single year since 1992 uh, has been on the list of the 20th, 20 warmest years on record. We're getting warmer every year. In the last 100 years, the global surface temperature rose about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's estimated that in the next 100 years, that the global temperature may rise as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, the, the indirect impact that's going to have on creating nat uh, natural disasters, uh, uh, from typhoons to hurricanes to floods, so global climate change is a, is a hugely important uh, present and future determinant of uh, pu public health. We know the effects of outdoor air pollution, but almost two million people die from indoor air pollution. This is seen when women and their children cook indoors. They cook in small closed spaces, small mud uh, houses or, or grass huts, and they inhale all that smoke. So indoor air pollution is a major public health problem. And obviously political instability, regional conflict, war, uh, not only do these directly influence uh, citizens in those countries, but just think of all the, the millions and billions of dollars that are siphoned towards war efforts uh, and away from, from health care infrastructure. And I've just listed some uh, important uh, present examples down at the bottom, Sudan, Somalia, Somalia uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Gaza Strip. And then finally, looking ahead at uh, f some future social determinants of global health, uh, biological and chemical warfare. We've had a few very, very small uh, episodes. Uh, there was, in, in Japan several years ago, there was uh, a rise in uh, chemical poisoning um, terrorist episode uh, uh, in their uh, 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 underground in Tokyo. Uh, there have been a few isolated uh, anthrax uh, uh, cases or anthrax scares, but we really haven't seen a lot in terms of bio biological or chemical warfare or terrorism, but that's something that we need to prepare for, right? We've heard that even though smallpox has been eradicated for the last 39 years or so, that there are still uh, two stockpiles of smallpox, and that could be a perfect uh, agent of biological warfare in the future. And then how about nuclear threats? You know, we hear about uh, countries that are looking to develop nuclear capabilities and perhaps developing a dirty bomb that they can develop, that they can uh, bring into countries. So these are some of the future social uh, threats uh, to global health. The, the expression, the rich become richer and the poor become poor, is really true around the world. Uh, we do see an erosion of middle class in, in many, many countries of the world. Um, and that's obviously a bad thing. Uh, concomitant with that, however, are the, the uh, successes that we've had in longevity and, and disease processes and all kinds of healthcare indices, like infant mortality and maternal mortality. But, uh, but this factor, uh, this economic disparity is going to continue to fuel uh, health disparities around the world uh, for a long, long time. Well, I'm finishing my talk, and I want to ask, does this seem too much like doom and gloom? Okay, this, this would be the, the doom and the gloom photograph. Okay, a beautiful little girl in one of the slum areas in Pakistan. Or is this the way we view the future? You know? Depends on your mindset. Are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? Is the class half, half empty or half full? Um, in any event, thank you very much for letting me speak with you today, and let's, let's open things up for questions. Yes. And the uh, disparity in life expectancy. Yes. And is there any indication or any studies that would disclose the, with the movement towards gender equality yeah. and uh, availability of women in positions that were 
reserved for men if that gap is closing? I don't think anybody really understands the differences uh, b between uh, life expectancy of men and women. We, I, saw, I showed that slide there that indicated that that's true in almost every country and culture of the world. Uh, and at the same time that women live longer, they live with more diseases, they have more, uh, more physical complaints, they seek medical attention more frequently than their male counterparts, and yet they live longer. And I don't, I don't think anybody really understands that. Is it genetic? Um, is it cultural? It, it, it's hard to believe that it's cultural, isn't it? Because you see it in every culture. So I don't know what it is. I, and, I, and, and to answer the last part of your question, I don't think that we're getting closer. I don't think we're necessarily getting closer. Yes? The movie Contagion, did you see that? I haven't. I haven't seen that yet. It'll keep you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Supposedly a billion people die after influenza. It just takes off across the world. Yeah. And because of you know, jet traffic and everything like that, it spreads so much yeah. faster. Right, <laughs> right. I haven't seen the movie, but you know, uh, several years ago when we prepared nationally and internationally for the, um, uh, the swine flu, it turned out to be, as Shakespeare would say, kind of much ado about nothing, right? But it could have potentially been very serious. The swine flu uh, seems to behave like most microorganisms in that it does, it, most microorganisms don't cross species. And so diseases of monkeys remain diseases of monkeys. And infections that occur in swine or in other domestic livestock usually stay confined to those animal population. Um, and that was true for the swine flu. But the bird flu, everybody's heard of the bird flu? That's, that's much less common, but potentially much more serious because we've documented now on four or five continents that avian influenza is a microorganism can, has developed the ability to more easily transmit itself to, to human populations. And if mut mutations occur, allowing those bird flu organisms to do it much more easily, then that could represent um, a contagious disease like this that, had, that would have tremendous epidemic proportions. Yep. Um, and I think when we talk about epidemics like that, we're talking about uh, millions of people, potentially millions of people. Remember the, uh, probably none of us are old enough to remember the uh, influenza pandemic of, of 1918, right? Uh, but you know, estimates of 10 to 20 million people worldwide died. 10 to 20 million, that's huge. Over a, a short period of time, uh, 30 million have died from HIV, but over the course of about 25 years. But uh, huge numbers, and, and that, that, that still could be. So as unlikely as that movie would seem, it's really not all that unrealistic. Yes? I don't know, but it would have to be an African country. I don't know the specific country, but it would, it would likely be one of those countries in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, where the life expectancy for, uh, for people in general is less than 50. And again, the contribution of HIV, uh, malnutrition, uh, it, surely it would be one of those African countries, but I don't know which one. Yes? Yeah. Are there any you would particularly cite uh, as being outstanding we should continue to be giving to them? Yeah. Um, let me start with your first question. Um, a, a lot of countries of the world, probably most countries of the world, provide health care free of charge to their citizens, which is ironic in that it's something that we don't do. And even when we have an administration that says it would like to do that, we have so many people fighting universal uh, uh, health care. Um, 
yet the health care in those countries, in, in those poorest countries generally is not really good quality. Uh, however, in some of the poorest countries around the world, um, and I'll use just one example, Bangladesh, very concentrated population, very densely populated, uh, lots of infectious diseases uh, and uh, uh, lots of healthcare problems. They have a wonderful public health infrastructure. And so even if their curative health services are not good, their public health services, including education, are quite good. Uh, another example would be uh, one of the states in India called the Kerala state uh, that probably has, well, if India has 1.2 billion, this probably has several hundred million people, maybe not that much, but it has a huge population. Again, lots of, lots of healthcare problems, but they have a wonderful public healthcare infrastructure. Um, so healthcare services, curative services availability doesn't always translate into public health uh, 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 effectiveness. Uh, I don't know what the best uh, organizations are. You know, the ones that come to mind, uh, CARE, uh, some of the Catholic Relief organizations, um, Doctors Without Borders, things like that. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones out there. There's a lot of good ones. Oh, the bad ones. <laughs> yeah, there's some bad ones as well. I, you know, I, uh, I think you want you want to choose an organization that that donates at least uh, ninety percent of uh, ninety cents out of every uh, dollar to to uh, uh, the people that need it. You know, so only a ten percent uh, bureaucratic overhead. There's a lot of good ones though. Yes. Um, there is a small but growing trend in this country uh, against immunizing children. Mm -hmm. I personally know two well-educated women who are dead set against, I mean, what can be done? <laughs> yeah. I think continuing education, we see from time to time in various developed countries in the West, uh, these, these waves of uh, resistance to immunizations based often on hearsay. That, that this vaccination is associated with uh, autism or this one is associated with uh, this complication. And in most cases, in almost all of those cases, there is little documented uh, evidence that, 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 that those associations are, are, are true. Unfortunately, what happens in many of those instances where uh, a small s segments of the population uh, parents refuse, refusing to, to immunize our kids, is that we end up uh, having uh, outbreaks of those same diseases. And that's due to what we call the herd immunity. Have ever, has everybody heard that term, herd immunity? If there are a thousand people in a community, um, it may be only necessary to immunize 80% and the other 20%, and, and because only because 80% of the population is immunized against uh, an infection, that 80% won't come down with that infectious disease, and so they are going to be subsequently less uh, able to transmit that infectious disease to the other 20% that haven't been immunized. So the small segment of those people who don't receive the vaccine still benefit from the herd immunity of the others. But there comes a point if, 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 if a large enough segment of the population refuse to take a certain vaccination that that herd immunity goes down and then everybody becomes susceptible again to that disease. So um, in most cases, those, those concerns on the par part of parents are not well founded, you know. Fortunately, we have a, a, a wonderful national organization like the Center for Disease Control. This is the public health watchdog of not only our country, but the world. And so when they say that there is not a disease association or an association between this vaccine and this disease, you know, believe them. Yes, way in the back. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Well, parents, because they have fear that uh, the children are getting multiple vaccines at one time, don't like that idea, so they're scheduling them at, at space intervals. And actually, have an 
negative impact? Yeah, I think it's possible. You know, obviously, <clears throat> Uh, there are, a, a child in this country receives a lot of vaccines, a lot of, a lot of shots, right, before their, their fourth or fifth birthday. Uh, but yet there's a lot of potential benefit in those shots. Um, obviously, there's not just one schedule that's likely to be effective, and I suppose changing schedules for an individual case is pro probably wouldn't hurt very much. Um, but if you think about doing that, altering these very effective and proven uh, schedules, uh, do, doing that on a large-scale basis, uh, there is a potential for a hazard with that, sure. Yes? How successful have the governments uh, of sub-Saharan African countries been with their family planning uh, efforts? Yeah. You know, I'm not a family planning expert. This is a little bit out of my, my comfort zone. Um, um, probably not as effective as they should be, right? Uh, um, populations continue to increase, right? Even in Sub-Saharan Africa, where people continue to die in huge numbers from AIDS and other infectious diseases and other transition diseases, uh, still there's more people being born uh, than are dying, and so the population continues to rise. And so, uh, to answer your question pretty simplistically, probably not doing as good a job as they should. Yeah, but that's about as far as I can say. Yes. Uh, I had a similar question. Internationally. Internationally? I don't, unfortunately. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I, I wish I could comment on it, but I really I don't want to overextend myself. I don't know. Yes. And you're talking about international as well as domestic, right? I'm talking about international. International. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, again. Yeah, yeah. Dengue fever is caused by uh, a virus that's transmitted uh, from animal reservoirs uh, to humans by the bite of a mosquito, by a certain species of mosquito. And uh, dengue fever is, belongs as a disease to a, cl a collection of diseases called uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, that have the capacity to produce uh, high fever and bleeding manifestations because the, the infection can, uh, can uh, affect uh, small blood vessels that become leaky and, and leak blood then into the skin, into the GI tract, elsewhere. Um, what we've noticed in the last decade or so is that the geographic distribution of dengue has really picked up worldwide. We're seeing dengue in parts of the world, including the United States, where it wasn't previously very endemic or, or perhaps not endemic at all. But uh, again, because of the, the changing ecology that's allowing the mosquito vector to breed more successfully in different parts of the world. Uh, as, a mos as a mosquito broadens its geography, so does the disease. Yep, yep. Another one of the uh, environmental uh, determinants of, uh, of, of infectious disease. Yes. The New York Times this morning had a first page article on the use of contraceptive application increasing exposure, doubling exposure of women, double. And not only women have their exposure as a result of this, but their mates. 
increased uh, exposure to HIV was doubled. Now, are you familiar with that, and how do you balance this of population control versus HIV exposure? And, and what's doubling their risk of exposure to HIV? <coughs> the method of contraceptive device now, the application of the contraceptive method. Yeah. Well, we know that condoms is a barrier method. Okay, okay, yeah. It's a vaccine. I didn't see this article, but I saw something about a vaccine, mm -hmm. a birth control vaccine that, that adds to... Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah, well, that, that makes sense, though, doesn't it? It, 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 it? Anything that's not a barrier mechanism that prevents the, the, the physical spread or transmission of the HIV virus from one infected partner uh, to the other partner is, is not going to be effective. Uh, remember, when we use a condom, it's effective birth control, but it's also effective in, in, in preventing that, that physical transfer, transmission of HIV virus and other important diseases from one person to the other. If, if you do away with that barrier, uh, and now you're using a vaccine to uh, reduce pregnancy, you're, you're, you're likely increasing the risk of HIV transmission. So the, the, re, the really effective mechanisms uh, to use are the so-called barrier methods. Yeah, condoms, female condoms, things like that. Way in the back. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know that I can't talk about the specific reasons for specific diseases, but we are seeing an increase in certain hospital-borne infections. We call those nosocomial infections. Um, um, some of the factors may be the lack of effective antibiotics uh, available against the organisms that can cause these these uh, these infections. I, I would guess if I had to look for one unifying mechanism for the increase in not only hospital-wide infections, but the increase in community-acquired infectious disease of a certain kind, is drug resistance. That was that was pro that would probably be the most logical common denominator. You know, we see lots of antibiotic drug resistance. I'd actually taken that out of this talk just for the sake of brevity, but we haven't had much in the way of new antibiotics in the last two, two or three decades, really. We've had lots of Viagra-like drugs, right? We, we've had lots of uh, Me Too cholesterol drugs, you know, 10 or 15 drugs that lower cholesterol when, when we only need one or two. Uh, and so they're all around the world, there's increasing rates of, of uh, antibiotic resistance. And that leads to then a whole host of, uh, of, of new infections, many of which are hospital born. Yeah. Remember in many developing countries, you don't need a prescription in order to get an antibiotic. You can go to the chemist, as they call it, the, the local pharmacy, they call it the chemist. You walk in there and you can I'll take that one and I'll take that one. You can buy, a citizen can buy whatever antibiotics they want. And so when they, when they come to the doctors, they're often pre, they've often pre-treated themselves for things like malaria and typhoid fever, uh, but for a whole host of things. And so the, 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 the prevalence of drug resistance for a whole host of microorganisms has gone way up in the last two decades. Yes? When you showed the slides of life expectancy, yes. uh, Costa Rica had the same life expectancy as the U.S., yeah. and yet it's a much poorer country. No. Do you think their health care system has any lessons for both our country, where health care is really expensive, and other developing countries that don't have the same success? Yeah. You know, I, I would bet that that, that that figure is probably due to their public health infrastructure and their public health mindset rather than the availability of curative medicine. Uh, you're right, it is a poor country, although it's not as poor as other, some other Latin American countries, countries, but a lot poorer than the U.S., and yet similar life expectancy. 
But I would bet it's not due to curative services because we have the best curative services in the world right in the U.S., but we don't have the best public health infrastructure. And I, I, th I think that's where, where countries like uh, Costa Rica and Oman and the Middle East are very, very, uh, very, very far ahead of us. You know, as a physician, you can take care of one patient at a time. As a public health uh, individual, you can take care of uh, 1,000 at a time or 10,000 at a time. That's the, that's the mantra that my public health colleagues always, always uh, uh, use. And that's true, though. It's very true. So public health uh, policies and procedures and infrastructures are much more effective, uh, in, you know, dollar for dollar than curative health services. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of travel-related illness, and I've, I've, I've worked in and have run travel clinics before. And the key to success in, in, in enjoyable and safe travel is getting, taking everything that you're supposed to take beforehand and during travel. So getting all the immunizations that are recommended by the CDC. There's an, if, you, if, you, if you Google Center for Disease Control Yellow Book or CDC Yellow Book, this is the annual publication that lists all the recommended uh, and suggested vaccines by country for each of the you know, 223 countries around the world. Uh, and, and it'll list the kinds of uh, vaccines that you need to take, the kinds of medications that you need to take to stay safe, uh, malaria, antidiarrheal medicines, things like that. So it's called the CDC Yellow Book. That's the source. And it's very readable, so even, even if you're not a physician, it's, it's largely geared for uh, the lay population. Um, now, in order to receive those things, you have to go to the doctor then, but it, but it will very effectively allow you to know what you need if you're traveling to Turkey or you're traveling to uh, uh, Botswana. Well, thanks very much. You've been a great audience. Good questions. Thank you. Everybody want to come here this afternoon? This is a beautiful mountain range up in northern Pakistan. Pakistan is really a, a wonderful country. It's got so much bad press in the last few years, hasn't it? And it's such a dangerous place now, but the Pakistani people are wonderful. And the geography is amazing. This is way up north. There are three huge mountain ranges of the world. The Himalayas, the Hindu Kush on the western border with Afghanistan, and these are the Koram Koram Mountains. Yeah, beautiful.